Parker Thompson, welcome to Reboot. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to do the most conventional thing and ask you the literal title of this event, because we're very direct with it, like sort of what at a core level, and in your, I should do a better introduction of you. Obviously, you're at, you're at TNT Ventures. You've been in this space a long time. You've sort of been through five or six different narrative shifts in Silicon Valley, but you're also very prolific about what's going on in DC. So you're a great person to have this conversation with. But especially given the election results this weekend, as we're sort of looking forward, what do you think fundamentally DC doesn't understand about Silicon Valley? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you, th if you want to understand Silicon Valley, there's sort of two areas I might focus on as DC, right? Sort of one is, how do we think, right? And the other is, you know, what are our politics? And I think DC actually probably misunderstands both of those things. So, you know, forgive a little bit of a history lesson, but I think it's instructive. I think if you want to understand the modern Silicon Valley, which I would sort of define as post-95 internet Silicon Valley, right? Um, you kind of got to start in 95 when Microsoft was the evil empire and we hated them all and we kind of lived in their shadow. And I think the narrative of sort of 95 to 2001 was open wins, right? So open source, open internet, right? Open networks. Um, that was the formative narrative for every single person who's running a tech company in the Valley, whether they started in 95 or 2005, right? Which, you know, are there are some interesting differences there. So, um, you know, as you carry forward how we built these companies that everybody's talking about today, right? Um, we built them on that premise, open wins, right? So if you think about, for example, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, right? The whole idea was Facebook was like, well, we got to be open to win. We got to allow anybody to build on our platform. And sort of the, the narrative that's been retrofitted onto that is, these scumbags were trying to sell your data, right? It's exactly mm -hmm. the opposite. They were trying to enable small business. And I think what we all learned along the way was actually the natural state of these networks is not per se open, right? And you, you see that now, right? Um, Facebook, or um, sorry, Twitter almost died as a company trying to be too open. It's kind of an interesting historical um, story there. And so we're now in the process of trying to grapple with what it means to be Microsoft and right? what it means to be these 800 pound gorillas that are closed. And that's sort of the natural state. Um, I think when you layer onto that sort of this uh, belief that we all had that tech is just an unmitigated good in the world, right? Like the things that we're doing can't not be good, right? If you start with that premise, you build technologies in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that that premise is wrong. Right. These are just yeah. tools. People use them in different ways. And so I think we have also spent many years kind of coming to grips with that and trying to understand what the implications are and how we should behave as um, as people who are pushing this technology forward. Right. So you might look from the outside and say, these people are just idiots. Like, obviously, there's going to be Nazis and you've got to deal with the Nazis. Right. But that's just, you know, not where we started. And we've all been working through that with our therapists for quite a while now. Right. So, yeah. Um, that would be how I would think about the technology uh, bit of it. Um, and uh, just to make a plug for folks who really want to understand this, there's a great podcast series called the Internet History Podcast. Um, it's phenomenal. Just start at Netscape and move forward. And I think that you'll understand um, these companies and uh, this culture a lot better. Um, the other aspect of it is political, right? Before um, we I, get before oh, we get to yeah. political, let's 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 actually hit a couple of points within um sort of like how how are we thinking? Could you I like what you're framing this around 1995, 2000-ish is Microsoft is the evil empire. For within the DC sort of framework, the evil empire is now sort of like the big four, right? So you're sort of, the people would sort of say like the big tech companies, Apple, um, Facebook, Google, you know. Um, do you think Silicon Valley looks at those big tech companies today, the dominant players, the same way people are looking at uh, Microsoft in the 90s? Absolutely not. And I'll, I'll give you a good story, right? They, um, you know, when Yahoo launched, um, they they purposely tried to frame themselves as a directory, this thing outside of uh, a media company, rather. Um, so they weren't uh, competing with IE, competing with Microsoft on the internet. They were a media company, right? I think 
you had to frame yourself as non-competitive with the thing that you couldn't beat in 1995. Um, and I think today that's not the case, right? I would say the only, I guess Amazon is a company I would personally be afraid to compete with, but that's because mm -hmm. they don't care about profit, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so you, I, I'm looking for 90% margins. I can't compete against that, right? Um, Google arguably is challenging to compete against in certain ways, although we're seeing just an explosion of um, companies competing with various aspects of their business, right? You might see in the early stage uh, productivity applications, which maybe have not made it to DC, but are just exploding here, billion dollar companies. Um, you know, Facebook, there's a new competitor every day, we'll fund those, right? So I, I think as you look at these companies, um, they are not uh, they are not stifling competition in a way that maybe Microsoft was in the 90s, right? So I think the, the narrative around uh, monopoly is um, very overstated, right? I think when we're talking about that conversation, we should be talking about anti-competitive practices as mm -hmm. opposed to um, a structural inability to compete with these companies. So you don't buy the kill zone narrative, the idea that these just that no one will fund any. I mean, I guess you know you're 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 a VC yourself, so you do you not buy the idea that there is this large um, inability to get funding to compete with these companies? Then I mean, it's just actually not true, right? Like you mm -hmm. can just look at the data. I mean, this just is not a subjective question. You can look at the data, right? So just to give you an example, I mean, the, the talk of the town has been this company Clubhouse. Andreessen Horowitz just put ten million dollars into this thing, right? It's not a direct competitor to Facebook in the sense that it's not a, you know, a feed based social network, but um, it is a competitor, right? Like we are competing for time on the internet um, in these network effect spaces. So I think there, there's certainly a conversation we can have around how would you facilitate that, right? How would you make it less likely that these companies die in some sort of uh, kill zone? And I think you can look at it in terms of like different, um, like it may be true for certain sets of applications, but it's just not broadly true, in my opinion. Great. So yeah, let's get to your point on how the, the I think it's Silicon Valley's politics, if that's this thing that's not understood. Yeah, I think this is another thing that my, my observation, and I, I, I want to maybe make a provocative statement and, you know, we can get into it, which is, uh, you know, people from D.C. tell me D.C. is a crazy place, right? It's very different than America. I would say that Silicon Valley is more different than DC than DC is with America or more different than America than DC is, right? Silicon Valley is a crazy place. Its politics are very different. I think they're misunderstood from the outside. Um, you know, again, going back in the internet era, right into the 80s and even 70s, I mean, this is a place that we've just been left alone to build technology and no one's been paying attention. And we just made a crap ton of money doing it. We are all positive sum thinkers, capitalist, free market, creative destruction, right? Your company goes under, you get another job. There's just no fear of markets here. And I think that's actually very different than America. I mean, I think if you look at the political right in America today, um, you have, you know, populists, um, populists and authoritarians and various flavors of that. I think you sort of see that on the left as well, right? Like the political consensus in America it has various ways of thinking about markets, but nobody's like, heck yeah, let's just, let's burn it down and build it back up, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think the premise in Silicon Valley is that we are all, you know, relatively free market and in the extreme in a way that America is not. Um, so I think when you look at the left in Silicon Valley, that's really about um, what the Niskanen Center might call the free market welfare state, right? Like we believe in free markets driving innovation and government facilitating that, right? So we're happy to invest in society because we believe that that works, right? There's the kind of more classical libertarian side here, right? So small government here is not populist, right? Small government is actual classical libertarian, like now the government shouldn't have schools, right? Yeah. So, so <laughs> We're debating I, the fire I, department at a certain point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think when people outside of Silicon Valley look at Silicon Valley, they just see whatever is not their politics, right? Because they're thinking on a left-right spectrum that doesn't really map to the way that the Silicon Valley discourse is going here. So I think um, it's very natural for people outside. Like I have conversations with people outside and they're whatever they are, they're like, 
you're a fascist Republican or you're a socialist, right? Like I'm never anything in between. Um, And so I I think um, that is to me uh, a a point of friction in the conversation between tech and the rest of the country. Completely. So uh, I'm curious uh, to your provocative point, what, what do you think DC sort of shares with the rest of America? Because that's obviously like not the same. Right? That's like the opposite of like the received wisdom, obviously. I mean, you can tell me, right? Like I don't, I, I don't spend time in DC. So I, it's hard for me. It's it's much harder for me to talk about DC. So yeah. I, I read about DC, right? So I probably, <laughs> you know, understand DC about as well as folks who only read about Silicon Valley understand it. Yeah, of course. Um, so I, we're talking about Silicon Valley. Um, we had, you know, Jill Lonsdale on a few hours ago and he's leaving Silicon Valley. He's going to Austin. People are decentralizing yep. in different ways. Can you sort of speak about how the dynamic around how SV people think and their politics were changed as certain parts of the Valley ecosystem decentralized? Can you sort of speak to that idea? Or if, or is that even a theme or is that a narrative? I'm just curious what you think of that broad narrative. Yeah, I don't, I guess I'm, I'm skeptical that people's politics change much. I think we just apply them to what, you know, you know, we apply the narrative that we already hold to the facts as they come at us. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Joe, Joe has always been a guy who is um, very on the libertarian camp. Right. Um, and travels in those circles. Um, so now's a great time to move to Texas, get that tax rate. Um mm-hmm. It fits your narrative, right? Um, I mean, I, I will say, you know, the received wisdom when I started in venture in 2013 was you can't build a um, billion dollar company outside of Silicon Valley. In fact, I, I remember a good friend of mine, you know, a uh, big VC invested in him and said, you can't even, this was actually years before, it's more like 2005 you have to move out of San Francisco. You have to build it in Palo Alto. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we went from Palo Alto to then somebody did it in San Francisco and then you could kind of do it here to then people sort of diffusing out into the world. So I think the narrative that Silicon Valley was the place that you had to be if you wanted to do something meaningful was already dying. And the last nine months have been about just, you know, smashing in half. So I think in 10 years, you will still see a at least a plurality and maybe a majority of billion dollar companies built within 30 miles of my home, but it won't be the only way to do it and it won't be the only place to do it. So I think this is probably actually good for the rest of the country and good for the world. Yeah. So I guess to your point about the next 10 years, and so, that, so the point is you're not exactly bullish on the idea that decentralization itself is going to win out um, over sort of like the in-person network effects or those sort of things. Are you ready to go back to the office? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I hate this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I got my, I'm telling my kids to not come in here so I can do this call. Yeah. No, I think people, um, I think the way that we're going is we're going to see offices that are hybrid, right? So, um, like I have a friend who's starting a company that's just about building software for the way that they believe offices are going to exist, right? So teams are going to come together a couple of days a week in the office. You know, you're going to be there. Um, and then you're going to be at home or you're going to have more flexible schedules. So I think we'll see a lot more of that. But I personally am a believer that, you know, if you want to move up in an organization, you need to be an HQ. There is a, you know, a remote glass ceiling. Um, so you're going to be able to be an individual contributor anywhere you want. But that's already been the case for 15 years. Right. Um, so, you know, I've had coworkers in my entire career in Silicon Valley who've been you know, fully remote in Tucson, Arizona, or over here, or whatever, because that fits their lifestyle. They just aren't upper management. Yeah, completely. So back to the sort of more political side of things, how, you know, obviously, um, Joe Biden um, won over the weekend, that's the difference between Friday, how do you think a Biden administration will change the way tech is sort of thinking about politics? Not not thinking, but just sort of react, because I think the thing that must have been terrifying in the past four years is the idea if you're sort of a tech person, especially in sort of sensitive industries, sort of like wake up every morning and you're wondering what's the tweet today? You know, what's, you know, if you're at Uber, you're sort of wondering, is there going to be, who would have thought that Uber's surge policies would turn into this hyper-political thing with, when it, with a protest in New York in 2017? So how, do you think this dynamic will change at all? I mean, it's hard to know. It's hard to know exactly what the implications are, right? So, um, we may see some antitrust action, right? Um, we may see capital gains rates change. We may see we may see some things that affect us. But my perspective would be, um, in general, um, 
we there's just so much opportunity, so much money to be made, so many things to be built that we're just going to keep doing that. And maybe we'll be taxed a little bit more. Maybe the larger companies will be regulated. So I think the broad strokes are we're just going to keep on keeping on. Um, and then we'll see exactly what the details look like. Right. So, for example, I'm I'm relatively concerned about the privacy legislation that passed in California here. Uh, we may see that happen in Washington. That would just be a train wreck. Um, for small businesses, for innovation. So, um, you know, it's hard to know exactly what fires are going to start. I mean, the, the sort of the silver lining of the Trump administration was that it was entirely incompetent and PR based, right? So Trump can tweet about breaking up Amazon. They're not going to do it, right? So um, I think um, we maybe were more concerned in the last four years but in terms of actual concrete policy, we may may see more policy happen in the next four. It's just hard to know. Yeah, totally. And I think the last sort of policy-ish question is, do you have any sort of broad thoughts on the content moderation debate, which obviously sort of in the last week of the election, I'm sure you have thoughts on it, but yeah, just do you have any broad sort of perspective on how, is this to your framework of Am tweets about Amazon, will this just be something that's a hullabaloo, but nothing fundamentally changes, especially with divided government? What are your thoughts there? Um, well, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's an interesting question. I have a lot of thoughts on it. Um, I think that DC, so I think what DC is not understand is that the frame of the debate is nonsensical, right? So when you think about Facebook, for example, um, Facebook could show you thousands or tens of thousands of items, right? Units of content. Your time is the bottleneck there, right? You as a consumer want it to be filtered, right? So there is going to be a filter. We're not going to make the filter illegal. We can just regulate the filter to be beneficial to one party or another, right? So there's no such thing as not censoring within these products. The question is just who's censoring and what are they, how are they doing it, right? Uh, my personal preference is to not have government doing that. Other people can disagree. Um, I think, so I, so I think that's important, right? Like we're not talking about whether we're going to censor. It's just like, that's the way the world works because we have limited time and unlimited content, right? So the question is just, are these companies doing a good job and what could we do to make them do a better job? Um, I tend to think that, um, I tend to think that the right approach is cultural. I tend to think that um, it's underappreciated how much tech people don't wanna work for the Marlboro man. And so if you're sitting inside Facebook and you believe that you're working for the Marlboro man, you either wanna change that or get out and talent matters. So I, I tend to think the um, solutions to these things are cultural. Uh, uh, the other point I guess I would make is we are often hearing the sort of the, the suggestion that, um, look, these are where people are, the, these are the public square, right? And um, I just fundamentally reject that premise. I think the internet is the public square and you know the old meme like, sir, this is a Wendy's, like Twitter is the Wendy's, right? Like you're in there yelling and good for you, go, go out in the public square and try to earn an audience. So I am personally a believer in the right to free speech as opposed to the right to free reach. And I think that, um, I, I think we're gonna like, really when you get into the details of how you might regulate speech on these platforms, I just don't see concrete policy proposals that, in my opinion, make the world better. <laughs> um, if you think about putting the other political party in charge of the machine that decides what we see, right? So I think that's worth saying. Um, gosh, I'm trying to, uh, trying to think if there's anything else there. I mean, I could go on for ages about this, but that's probably a good place to stop. No, I mean, what, what's interesting of what you just said um, and I don't want to bring Joe into this too much, but this was this is juxtaposed nicely. He sort of framed this around to your point about this not being the public square. His sort of articulation was that these companies act as if they are the public square and they aspire to be the public square and they frame themselves as such. Um, so I, I don't so, so so that so that that part of the the map. So this is interesting then. So. I can buy that this is a Wendy's argument to you know put a title on that, but to what degree is it the responsibilities of companies themselves to articulate that point? Uh, well, look, we you know uh, calling yourself a platform is something you do to get a high valuation, right? We all want to invest in a platform. It, like what's important for us when thinking about policy is not what these people say they are, right? In fact, actually, they usually say the opposite, right? If you if you have a terrible business, you call yourself a monopoly. If you call yourself a monopoly, you say that 
uh, we're a terrible business, competition is a click away, whatever, right? Um, so it's actually probably uh, important for us to forget about what they call themselves mm -hmm. and think about what they are, right? So I tend to think that they are businesses on the public square as opposed to the public square. Um, I mean, I think, I think Joe, yeah, I just fundamentally disagree with the, the premise that like, well, this is where everybody is, therefore you have a right to speak here. Yeah, completely. So last topic relating to your day job then, um, what are you, we're in COVID, this is the time to build, insert like branding phrase. Um, what are you interested in investing right now? Um, you know, your fund recently started up, but what, what are you excited about? Well, so we have a relatively narrow focus, right? We focus on enterprise SaaS. So, um, you know, the policy world uh, doesn't touch us as much as it might some of these other things. Um, I think mean, we're just excited. You know, the world sucks, right? It's full of terrible processes, inefficient businesses, terrible software. We are in a target rich environment. And so um, I just think there's, you know, there's the bottleneck to making money in Silicon Valley is talent, right? There's the, like venture is such a teeny little market with such so little money, right? Um, and you talk about early stage venture because it's just trying to find good businesses to invest in, but the problem is full of, or the world is full of problems. So we're excited to just about great founders building, you know, anything they're building, right? So I gave you an example of uh, a founder that I know who just started a business making scheduling software for these new workplaces, right? Like what's the workplace gonna look like? How are we gonna run it? Um, like facilities management, kind of boring, but you know, whatever, it's, it's great business. So we're real excited there. I think when you zoom out and you look more broadly at, you know, where can we go and vis-a-vis -vis government policy, right? I think the biggest levers the government has that can be useful are, um, creating the right market incentives, right? So for example, you know, today we implicitly subsidize carbon that has retarded the development of clean energy technologies. Um, there's people working on synthetic meat products, for example, super interesting technology. That stuff would be a lot more viable and get a lot more capital if um, the markets were properly oriented around, you know, pricing and the externalities. So I think those are things government can be thinking about in terms of maximizing the uh, the innovation that's coming out of tech more broadly than what I'm focused on. Um, I, for what it's worth, I will say a debate, you know, Joe and I might disagree on, you know, um, uh, capital gains rates. Um, so Joe might say, you know, it's going to be a disaster if, if we tax capital gains as income. I would love to make more money. I would love to not have my income taxed, but um, I, I tend to think that that's really marginal, right? Like we're building technology. We're going to fund anything that has that 100x potential and will be taxed as we're taxed. So uh, maybe bring it back to the policy in DC there. Yeah. So last question with two minutes to go. What do you think from your reading to your point? What do you think Silicon Valley doesn't get about DC, right? We sort of started with what does DC not get? What do you think Silicon Valley doesn't understand around like the broader dynamic here? Um, Silicon Valley is phenomenally unsophisticated about um, policy and politics, right? Because we just haven't ever had, we didn't have to deal with that to build these companies, right? So we're incredibly unsophisticated. So I think um, we just don't understand very much at all. And I think what that means is sometimes it may look like we're playing 10D chess when we're not even understanding the rules to the checkers that are happening in DC. So I think that's worth keeping in mind, right? Like there is still a lot of misunderstanding probably bi-directionally um, just because we're out here going like, we never had to think about politics at all. In fact, we just didn't think it was useful um, and now you guys are trying to regulate us and talking about us. So I guess we got to engage with it. That's great. Well, Parker, thank you so much for joining. This is really helpful. Hopefully someone on either side understands something after this. Yeah. Hopefully so. and anybody feel free to reach out to me if, uh, you know, I'd love to, I love to talk about policy stuff. Um, actually my, uh, grad work was in intellectual property policy. So, uh, it's not a big headline one, but I love to nerd out uh, with that on people uh, with, with people on that, and uh, you know, happy to happy to keep the dialogue going. Great, thanks. All right, thanks. Have a good one.